bless the name of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Indeed, the Lord has brought us from a mighty, mighty long way, and we give God praise today on this, our late day. You may be asking, what is late day? Well, if you're a member of any of our AME churches, you are considered to be a member of our lay organization, and so we celebrate today uh, all those who make up this amazing August body of believers. Amen. We've come to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So come on, let's gather around the camera. Amen. Let's make a point of connection with the person next to us as we open up with a word of prayer. Kind and gracious Father, we thank you and we honor your presence today. For indeed, you have been mighty, mighty good to us. Down through the years, God has been good to us. And so, Father, we pray that what you have been in our past, you will do for us today. That you will save someone, heal someone, deliver someone, set someone free. Oh God, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, worship and praise has always been a part of our history. And so in this day, we will bless the Lord, oh our souls and all that is within us. God, we make room for you in this place. We say, God, do whatever it is that you desire to do in this house. Anoint our worship afresh, oh God. Let our praises be a pleasing aroma to your nostrils. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, if you're in agreement, tell God thank you. Come on, let's enter into worship. Come on, let's lift up holy hands. Let's bless the name of the Lord, for God is great and greatly to be praised. Praise the Lord, everybody. I said praise the Lord, Greater Allen. Come on, all over this room, can you open your mouth and give him the greatest shout of praise that you can? I need this section over here to open your mouth and give him a great shout of praise. Oh no, I need everybody on the floor to lift up a praise in this room. We came to give him glory, honor, and praise because he's worthy. Just tell your neighbor he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Come on, clap those hands like this, everybody. Come on, clap. Father, this day is all about you. Have your way in this service this morning. Come on, clap those hands. Simple song. Let's declare it together. Glory, glory, glory to our King. Glory, glory, glory to our King. Glory, glory, glory to our 
praise to our King today. I said, somebody give him a great praise today. We cry glory. We cry glory to our King. I don't have no praises that came to give him glory. We cry glory. I had about 30 praises. Let it open your mouth and give them glory today. Oh no, I said give them glory today. I need the balcony to give them glory. I need the back to give them glory. I need the leaders to give them glory. I need the choir to give them. I said give them glory. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, he knows whether I'm right or wrong. Look at somebody else on the other side and tell them, neighbor, tell him he knows. Oh yeah, I hear you, whether I'm right or wrong. The choir's coming at this time. Come on, clap those hands.
praying, while we're here worshiping, search us, Lord, search us, Lord. Hallelujah. Father God, let us pray. Thank you, Father God, for this yet another day that you've blessed us to come and worship you in spirit and in truth. We're sorry to, to announce the passing of two of our members, Brother James William Samuel of the Mayor Lusher Board and Sister Brenda McRae from the Seniors Ministry, Our Power Bible Study. Let us touch and agree in Jesus' name. Father God, we ask that you would bless the families of our recently departed members. We ask, Lord God, that you would put your loving arms around them, Lord God. Touch them, Lord God. Touch their families, Lord God. Be a hedge of protection around them, Lord God. Build a fence of protection around them, Lord. And Lord God, we ask that you would bless anyone, Lord God, that has, is, is in our bereavement, Lord God, that we did not announce. For some of us, Lord God, may be sick in body, but we pushed our way to the sanctuary. We may be sick in body, but we pushed our way to virtual worship today. And so, Father God, in the name of Jesus, leave no one untouched, Lord God. For we know that you have provided healing and strength and power, Lord God. For you are the God that healeth thee, Lord God. We thank you for your balm of healing, Lord God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord God, that you would touch us, Lord God, in a special way. Touch those who are in hospitals and nursing homes, Lord God. Touch those, Lord God, who just may have woken up with a migraine, Lord God, because we know you're the God that can do all things but fail. So we thank you, Lord God, for your healing. We thank you for touching our bodies, Lord God. We thank you for starting us on our way. We thank you, Lord God. For we know that you can heal the sin-sick soul, Lord God. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for healing of mental illnesses, Lord God, because you can do it. We thank you, Lord God, for all that you're going to do. And we touch and agree, decree and declare that it shall be in the name of Jesus. Search us, Lord God, and bless us, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, while we're still standing, can we just lift up our hands and just worship the Lord? Come on, in the sanctuary, if there's something that you came in here with a need of, just begin to lift your hands. Don't worry about who's next to you, who's around you. Just begin to lift up your hands and call on the name of Jesus. your hands right here. Here's my worship. All of my worship. Yes, Lord. Receive my worship. All of my worship. Come on, one voice, everybody declare it. Say, here's my worship. Come on, all over the sanctuary. Come on, let the Lord hear you this morning. Come on, build it up, all of my worship. Come on, let's go. Declare it. Here's my worship. All of my Come on. Father, receive. Come on, this morning, Father, all my worship.
Come on, come on, let the worship fill the room. Say, and I will not be. Come on, set the atmosphere, set the atmosphere. Set the atmosphere for the Lord to move in this place. Come on, lift your hands as long as I am breathing. God, you give me the ability. You give me the strength. You give me the power. You give me the wisdom. I will always, I will always, I will always. Oh, well, you ought to lift your hands in the sanctuary. I cannot be silent, Lord. I will always worship you. Are there any worshipers in the building? Come on, worship the Lord with the fruit of your lips. As long as I am breathing, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the powerful one, the omnipotent one, the omniscient one, the omnipresent one, the strong one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. the Lord of Shabbat praise. Hallelujah. Come on, come on. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. We give you praise today. Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. Hallelujah. We have gathered in this place we have gathered even online to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Let the people of God say amen and amen. Even as you go to your seats, why don't you just wave your hands in adoration, thanksgiving, declaring that the Lord is good and worthy to be praised. Well, this is March 17th, the day the Lord has made and we have come today to uh, celebrate our lay organization. This is Lay Day, and we're going to ask them to stand, a very dynamic group of laity who serve their church with zeal, who serve their church with commitment. And uh, Reverend Carson said it earlier, all of you who are not ordained clergy are lay. And uh, they certainly would love if you would come and join them and work with them. They do great things. And so uh, 
if you need the information about when they meet, and we certainly want to celebrate uh, Sister Pat Thornhill for the work that she does, not only locally, but district-wide, amen. Let's give them a praise, and we thank God for each and every one of you, amen. Also on this lay day, we would, uh, we have some uh, ushers that um, we want to celebrate as we are just looking back over the years and we see some people who have just continued to uh, represent, to serve their church. We, uh, on usher board number one, we have three 50-year members. That's a long time. Sister Linda Morant who also serves as uh, the director of the Allen Christian School. And she's been doing that for about 40, what, seven years, I guess. Is Sister Linda Moran here? Come on, come on up, Sister. What are they saying? She, well, tell her to come down. <laughs> Sister Linda Moran, Sister Helen Jackson. Come on, we just want them to come and stand up front. And Sister Wilma Brody. <laughs> come on, as they come, just give them a hand. 50 years. Amen. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Give them a hand. And then we have Maud Webson, who has served for 30 years. Sister Maud. Is she here? Oh, there she comes. Okay. 25 years, Ann Morrison. There she is. Come on, let's give these ladies a hand. There's nothing greater than commitment to the kingdom of the Most High God because they're not only committed to their church, they are committed even more so to the Lord that they serve, and we want to celebrate them. 50 years, 30 years, and 25 years. And then we have two. Uh, I see Diane Kerman and Carol Pete. Are they here? They are coming as they are celebrating 10 consecutive years of service. We thank God for these ladies. You have, uh, they have received their plaques and they're coming with flowers, and we need you all to take some pictures so we can post them later today. Come on, church, let's give these ladies a hand. Usher board number one, President Sister Sandra G., we thank God for each and every one of you. Amen. God bless you. Wait, they're coming with flowers. They're getting more flowers. Amen. How befitting is this on lay day? <laughs> All right, ladies, thank you so much, and may the Lord God continue to bless you and keep you as you continue in your service. We are so, so, so honored that you have served your church with such diligence and commitment. Amen. Well, our coffee hour is hosted today by the men's ministry and they are hoping that you will come to the uh, lower level and let them serve you. We continue with our virtual Bible study on tomorrow night at seven o'clock p.m. Uh, the book of study, this is our women's Bible study, is um, uh, certainly one that has blessed us through the uh, week. Uh, through the season, and we hope that you will join us tomorrow, 7 o'clock p.m. The Bible study is not on Facebook, but you can go to our website and stream it, and we certainly hope that you will do just that. 
the, lay, uh, the Lawyers Guild is presenting a family court webinar, The Child Support Dilemma. There will be a discussion on Friday, May 22nd, I'm sorry, not May, March 22nd at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, we have uh, representatives from the family court and lawyers from the Lawyers Guild. They will share important information on navigating child support issues. The information for the Zoom is on the screen and it will be on the church website. Please govern yourselves accordingly. Well, Saturday is Sister to Sister, March 23rd. We will be here in the Cathedral Sanctuary. Ladies, we invite you to bring your good girlfriends. We invite you to bring your sisters, uh, those who have blessed your life. Uh, one um, one uh, writer said, and I can't remember who it is, but she said, uh, to have a good friend, amen, makes you rich in blessings from the Lord. Good friends are God's gifts to us, and we love to celebrate sisterhood, and we ask that you would come. We are going to hear a lively conversation uh, between me and uh, my girls. Lord have mercy. And so we are looking forward to that. Holy Week uh, begins next week. Uh, we will start with Palm Sunday next Sunday, and then we're going to have our women at the four women at the cross service with preachers, doctors, uh, Sharika Newton, Pastor T. Ann Brown, Williams, uh, Pastor Melaine Rochford, and our very own Reverend Marissa Farrell. That's Monday night, the 25th, and then our Holy Thursday service will be on March 28th with Pastor Jerry Carter all the way from New Jersey. And then on Good Friday, we will gather here in the sanctuary at 12 noon, and we will have members of our ministerial staff that will do our seven last words. And then we are excited because Resurrection Sunday is March 31st and the conclusion of our Lenten fast. Let the people of God say amen and amen. Also on Resurrection Day, uh, the uh, Sunday School and the uh, Ignite Youth Ministry will be coming together for their resurrection program at 11.30 a.m. in the Cathedral Banquet Hall. The Sunday School will also host a bake sale on Resurrection Sunday as they are raising money for, to, for scholarships for their graduates. We're looking forward to Women's Conference, April 11th through 13th. Uh, as of Monday night, we only had about 50 slots left. Uh, we were at our, we were right at our number, 850 have already registered, so we need those of you who intend to go, don't put it off. Don't put off for tomorrow, what you might not be able to do to, uh, uh, tomorrow. You need to do it today, amen. And of course, we are, Looking at our, um, a couple of save the dates, we will have our legacy luncheon on Saturday, May 18th at the Floral Park Terrace, the Floral Terrace at 12 noon, amen. Tickets will go on sale Monday, April 1st. We look forward to seeing you there as we begin our legacy celebration. Uh, uh, and we are certainly honored and looking forward to the, uh, these events. Uh, our Legacy Weekend um, mm, is Friday, May 31st through Sunday, June 2nd. The Legacy Weekend will be the Flake Legacy Weekend, will be an exciting weekend. On Friday night, there will be nostalgic gatherings of ministries, amen, uh, and we're looking forward to that fun. We will be sharing fond memories and creating new ones with cherished friends and family as we honor and celebrate the impact of the Flake legacy on uh, this church and certainly uh, in this community. On Friday night, as I said, various ministries will get together and celebrate in their own way. I know Allen Christian School is coming together, ALDM, and so we're looking forward to the ministries, the stewardesses, uh, to come together, uh, past members, members who've moved away, 
uh, hopefully you will have, we will have reunions on uh, that Friday night and then also on Saturday, June 1st is Legacy Community Day. This will be similar to the street naming event that we had a few years ago. Uh, we plan for it to be outside. The day will begin with prayer in the sanctuary at 10 o'clock a.m. and we will have special celebrations in parking lot two and then we will culminate Legacy Weekend on Sunday, June 2nd with our guest preacher being my friend and the one who's been around a long time, been around Allen a long time, Bishop Jacqueline Eulalie McCullough. Uh, we certainly are looking forward to that. Let the people of God say amen. Well, it is giving time at the cathedral. I'm gonna say that one more time. It is giving time at the cathedral. Everybody who's blessed, just wave your hand. Everybody who knows that God has done great things in your life, just wave your hand. We give because we want to give. We give because giving is the right thing to do. We give because we want to be obedient to biblical mandates that are, uh, that are in the Old and the New Testament. Amen. Give and it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, back in good measure, will be poured into your laps. Amen. And so we're asking you now to take this opportunity to give and give generously, give obediently uh, back to the Lord. And certainly as we receive these gifts, you enable us to continue to do the uh, transformative ministry that we have been able to do through the years. We're so grateful uh, for God's presence in this church. We're grateful for God's trusting us to do the work that we have done. And certainly we want to continue to live with a kind of commitment to not just to us as a church, but to the community. Let the people of God say amen. And so we hope and pray that you will take this opportunity for those of you who are viewing us uh, virtually, the giving instructions are on the screen. And for those of you who are here in the sanctuary, if you are not giving electronically, please prepare your gifts now and hold them to the very end of the service and we will receive them as you depart from the sanctuary. Let the people of God say amen. There is a preacher in the house, the Reverend Charles Goodman, who is the most most prolific pastor of the Tabernacle Baptist Church down in Augusta, Georgia. I know that there will be a video announcement, but I just want him to know how honored we are that he has joined us on today. He's doing great work, great work, great work in Augusta, and we pray that the Lord will continue to bless him. He will come uh, after the video introduction and after the singing of the sermonic hymn. We will be blessed by the ministry of this young man who's, uh, who is, whose life has certainly been touched by the hand of the Lord. Let the people of God say amen. The Reverend Dr. Charles E. Goodman Jr. is a sought after speaker, revivalist, and lecturer. For 17 years, he served as a senior pastor of the historic Tabernacle Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia. Under his dynamic leadership and vision, one church in multiple locations was birthed, which now encompasses over 15,000 partners with multiple weekly services, virtually and in person. Dr. Goodman received his undergraduate degree from Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, a Master of Divinity degree from Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and his Doctor of Ministry from Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. He also holds a Master of Management with a Concentration in Organizational Leadership degree from Cambridge College and a Doctor of Philosophy and Leadership degree from Anderson University in Anderson, South Carolina. He is also a proud member of Omega Psi Phi and Sigma Pi Phi fraternities. Dr. Goodman has authored four books, You Can't Run From Purpose, Road to Recovery, The Flip Side of Favor, and It's Complicated. Dr. Goodman serves on numerous community boards and as an adjunct professor. He is a content contributor to many ministry publications and is called upon to empower and encourage others around the world. Church family, join us as we welcome Reverend Dr. Charles E. Goodman Jr. to the Greater Allen AME Cathedral of New York.
magnificent, marvelous God. He is deserving of our glory and our honor. As our hands are lifted, will you worship the Lord in prayer with me? God, we thank you for you alone are worthy to be praised. For the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, God, you have been an awesome God. And we come to this day not because we've been so good, but because you have been faithful. And for that, we give you honor and we give you praise. We celebrate this opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we are grateful for the brothers and sisters that you've aligned with us in this corporate gathering, not just in person, but also online. So now, God, as we have worshipped you and had time for stewardship and fellowship, now, God, it's time to hear a word from you. And I pray now, God, that you would once again send your word in this place. We need to hear from you. I pray now that it would simply do the work upon the hearts of your people. Lord, I stand in need of you right now. Too small for this assignment. Lord, I've studied, but I need you. Prayed, but I need you. Send the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy tonight. And I pray that on this day, God, you would once again bless your people afresh. We pray that someone would be saved and set free. That someone will remember that the blood still works. And we give you honor for that. Bless this house. Bless our pastor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, clap those hands. If God has been good to you, clap those hands. If he's made a way for you, clap those hands. If he's your all in all, come on, put those blessed hands together and let's celebrate our God. While we're celebrating our God, can we celebrate our pastor, the one, the only, Reverend Dr. Elaine Flake. Come on, let's thank God for Mama Flake and we appreciate her and the Flake family, to Pop Flake and others. It is good for us to be here to share at the Great Allen Church and to those who are part of our lake community and lay family god bless you we bring you greetings all the way from la lovely augusta and it's just good for us to be here on today amen 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 well let's get to work my brothers and sisters i invite your attention to the book of mark mark chapter eight and so walked into the sanctuary to see that this year is a year of miraculous manifestations that thing kind of confirmed uh, what i believe the lord wanted me to share at this hour at this time can we thank God for this music ministry? That is just amazing. You guys are incredible, man. Mark chapter 8, and while you're finding there, once again, this is just a true honor for me to stand and share amongst people that I honor and revere so much. I pray, Greater Allen, that you appreciate the gift that has been laboring in this vineyard. And once again, Dr. Flake, thank you again for this gracious invitation to come and share the word of God. Mark chapter 8, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, but as long as your book says Bible, you are absolutely fine. Mark chapter 8, beginning around verse 22, let's hear what the word has to say to us at this moment. It reads thusly, when they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus, and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village, then spitting on the man's eyes. He laid his hands on him and asked, can you see anything now? The man looked around. Yes, he said, I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. And then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were open. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. Again, text says, verse 25, then Jesus places his hands on the man's eyes again. And his eyes were open. His sight was completely restored and he could see everything. So look at someone say everything clearly. For the time that we have to share on this morning for late Sunday, I want to trouble your patience for a little while. I want to talk from this idea. It can't get more clearer than this. Look at someone next to you tell him it can't get more clearer than this. Lift your hands all over the middle and say, Lord, speak. We need to hear. You may be seated in the presence of our God. It can't get more clearer than this. I really acknowledge, my brothers and sisters, that traveling has become a blood sport. In that way, oftentimes, depending upon you, which way you go from A to Z, we oftentimes know the challenges that are now surrounding how we are transported. 
Because I'm from Augusta, Georgia, oftentimes I have to make my travels through our airport. And I love those who serve in our Augusta Regional Airport, but because of it being such a small airport, oftentimes for me to go to the various destinations that I must go to once again fulfill the assignments that I have, it takes me all the way through Atlanta. There's problems with that simply because if there's any delays to my flight out of Augusta, it could hamper and hinder my travel to the other destinations. Never forget, not too long ago, I found myself in one of those predicaments. I had safely made it through TSA, and I was now given escort onto the plane. Now, putting my bag above my head, I spoke to the stewardess. I sat down, and I was beginning to meander and go through my phone. After a while, time got away from me. I watched as people came onto the plane, but then something struck me. I looked down at my phone, and guess what was happening? The time of our departure had already came and went. This was going to be a problem because I had a tight connection. I needed this flight to be on time because if I miss this connection in Atlanta, who knows when the next flight is going to come. I started getting a little antsy. I asked the stewardess, can you please tell me, man, what's the problem? Why are we delayed? I was expecting her to give me some of the routine issues that have come up in the past. I mean, being delayed was nothing new to us in this moment. There have been often times the plane has been delayed because of some mechanical issues. There have been other times the plane has been delayed because of too much baggage on the plane. So I'm already running in my mind, what is the reason? What is the rationale? Why are we stuck on the runway? And that's when the steward said, well, sir, our pilot's getting ready to come on, and he's going to explain more fully why we are delayed. And just as she stated, a few moments had passed, and just as she had stated, the intercom goes on, and this is the pilot, and he assures us, he said, hey, ladies and gentlemen, I know you're a little concerned about why we have not been able to lift off yet. He said, well, uh, I just want to let you know and give you an update about why we are stalled. He said, here's the problem. We have too much fog on the runway. He said there's too much fog on the runway, and he made this statement as the pilot. He says uh, that because there's too much fog on the runway, it has caused me to have low visibility. And because of low visibility, I cannot take off at this time. Until visibility becomes higher, we're stuck in this same place. I raise that today, my brothers and sisters, because that thing got me. It's not that the plane was stuck because of mechanical issues. It wasn't because there was too much baggage on the plane. The reason the plane could not take off is because the pilot could not see. And I want to raise that for many of us today because I would surmise that there are many under this sound in my voice in person or even online and maybe that's why you're stuck in life. It's not that you don't have big dreams and great visions and things that you want to accomplish. It's not that God doesn't have an assignment or a destination on your life. But just as I learned sitting on that plane, there are some things you are stuck in, some places you will be held back on simply because you can't see correctly. And I want to raise that for us today because I know we've showed up for late Sunday, but I want to suggest that there's someone under the sound of my voice that has not understood the importance of having good, clear vision from God. God gives vision. God gives us understanding. God gives us clarity. But I'm talking to someone today that when you look at your life, things are not as clear as they need to be. And until you get that thing clarified, I'm here to tell you, uh, you're going to be stuck in the same place. I know there's someone that's raising the query, preacher, why, why should I be worried or concerned about vision? Well, I want you to know that when you look at the economy of God, God allows us to experience vision because it puts some things in their proper place. First of all, vision allows us to have what I call accepted priorities. When you can see clearly, it teaches you how to properly prioritize your life. Vision and clarity gives us accepted priorities, but it's not just accepted priorities, but I also suggest it gives us us accredited pathways because it's one thing to prioritize your life and it's another thing to make sure you're headed in the right direction and until your vision gets right until you have what God has for you it puts things in priority it orders your pathways but then I also offer it gives to us accelerated progress because when you can
can see clearly, God is able to speed you along and give you a different velocity than what you would have had before. I want to suggest today that I've come on assignment to let somebody know that God is working on your vision. God is working on your clarity. He wants to make sure that your life is prioritized, pathways are accredited, and your progress is accelerated. However, my brothers and sisters, here's the, the challenge of what I want to raise today because I can tell there's some in person, you're nodding in agreement. You're saying that sounds good to me, preacher. We got you all the way from Augusta to tell us that we need vision. However, I want to suggest here's the problem is that you can agree with the priorities. You can agree with the pathways. You can nod in agreement with the progress. But here's the reality. In order for clarity to be achieved in your life, it's not just priorities. It's not just pathways. It's not just progress. Somebody can testify. It oftentimes takes a process. And I want to suggest today, my brothers and sisters, uh, is that's what our text in Mark chapter 8 begins to lift up for us uh, because we are introduced to a man who was stuck, a man who was blind, a man who could not see. But when he meets uh, a man named Jesus, Jesus uh, touches the man twice. Uh, and by the time the man leaves Jesus, uh, the man who was blind uh, can now clearly see. Let me try it again. I done gave you the whole sermon in a cliff note form. There is a blind man uh, in Mark chapter 8. He meets Jesus. Jesus touches him not once but twice. And by the time the man leaves the presence of Jesus, the man can see clearly. Okay, excuse me. I know it's a Methodist church, but I'm Baptist. Let me tell you a third time. Notice what it says. A blind man, somebody that's stuck, somebody that could not see, somebody who was not functioning at their proper level. But when they meet Jesus, Jesus touches him not once but twice. And by the time the man leaves Jesus' presence, the man can can see clearly. I got good news to tell you that this is just an instance uh, that if you ever get an opportunity Jesus can turn your life around. Do me a favor and touch somebody close to you uh, and tell them Jesus can turn your life around. Jesus uh, can open up your blinded eyes. Jesus uh, can turn things around uh, in your life. However uh, the only way you can experience uh, this miraculous Jesus uh, is you got to learn how to submit to the miraculous process. And that's what our text List for us up today because it's interesting the process this man, this blind man, has to go through in order to get his sight by Jesus. And I want to leave them up for us today. I have a few things I want you to ponder today. I, I just have some observations that's lifted up in this text that I believe that if you and I were to look at what this man had to go through uh, in order for his sight to be given to him, uh, it will show us what you and I must do uh, in order to submit to the process of the miraculous. Here it is, my brothers and sisters, if you're taking notes, let me give you the first of three principles. Because first thing that I note in this passage, how this man was able to get his sight back, first of all, note, he lets you and I know the first part of the process is environments must be changed. It's right there in the passage. Environments must be changed. Here we are in Mark chapter 8 and it's important that when we are dropped into this episode, notice what's taking place. The Bible introduces us uh, to the main, uh, main character of this uh, pericope with this miracle with Jesus. We are introduced to him as uh, a blind man. Now, y'all excuse me, my brothers and sisters, but, but I am a little taken aback by this introduction. I know this is not odd for Scripture, but when moments like this happen, I, I struggle a little bit because uh, we don't get no other information about who uh, this man is. We don't know his birth certificate. We don't know where he's come from. We don't know his mama. We don't know his daddy. We don't know his fraternal affiliation. We don't even know where he worked at. We don't know all these personal things with him, but we do know he's blind. We get no other private information. We can't tell you how much he makes a year. We don't even know what his 401k is. We don't even understand his address. We don't know what car he drives. We don't know what high school he attended, but we do know that he's blind. And I will tell you that causes me some chagrin this morning uh, because I struggle with this uh, because what do you do, child of God, when people don't know anything about you uh, but what you struggle with? Well, what happens, child of God, when people don't know uh, anything uh, that you have going on, but all they know is what you are, are wrestling with. I'm talking to some people in here uh, that folks see you coming uh, and folks see you going uh, and they don't know anything about you uh, but what you struggle with. Uh, all they know is the blind areas uh, 
of your life. All they know is the struggles that you have. What happens when all people know is what you are wrestling with? I want to talk to some folk here that that's where your lot in life is, is that people just keep looking at you based on what's wrong with you. He's a blind man. And the text tells us, watch this, this blind man gets brought to Jesus. He's blind, can't see, and the text tells us that we get no indication that he's checking for Jesus. We don't even know if he knows who Jesus is. But he's connected to some people that know what he needs, and they know he needs to get to Jesus. That he's connected to people that know his problems, and they know the solution and they decide to bring the problem and the solution together. Okay, maybe I need to have a few witnesses in the house because maybe you and me have the testimony of this blind man that there be a period in my life. I didn't know who Jesus was. I wasn't checking for Jesus. I thought I was just going to be stuck in my situation. But thanks be to God that God would assign some people in our lives that know what we need and will connect us and bring us to Jesus. I come to talk to some folk in Greater Allen. Uh, come on, I know you're in church now. I know you served in the lay ministry, and I know that you've been a faithful member for some years. But let's go back in time uh, and look over your life. Uh, can the truth be told? You weren't checking for Jesus, uh, but you had a praying grandma that brought you to Jesus. Uh, you had somebody in your family that brought you to Jesus. Uh, you had somebody uh, that you knew uh, that said, I know what you need, uh, and you need Jesus. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm here because I had some folk bring me to Jesus. Uh, I had some folk that prayed for me I had some folk that knew uh, that what I needed in my life uh, was not another hit uh, was not this or that but if I could just get in the presence of Jesus everything would be all right they bring them to Jesus and I love the text because the text then says that when they bring them to Jesus watch this they don't just drop them off at Jesus but they start to talk to Jesus about what they need Jesus to do for the man they didn't just bring them to Jesus they interceded for the man. See, it's one thing, brothers and sisters, for us to try to bring people to Jesus. But what I'm coming to encourage somebody today is just not bringing people to Jesus. You got to see the whole process all the way through. Notice what they did. They said, Jesus, we need you to touch the man and heal the man. We need you to do something on his behalf. So they drop him with Jesus. They tell Jesus what they need done. Now watch how Jesus responds. He grabs the man by the hand and takes him outside of the village. Hold on, y'all. I got a problem. I'm a nosy reader of scripture, so y'all pardon me today. Because when you look at Jesus' response and you put it up against what they asked for, that ain't what they asked Jesus to do. They asked Jesus, touch him and heal him. But the Bible says that Jesus took him by the hand outside of the village. Hold on, Jesus. This ain't what we prayed for. We, we want you to open his eyes right now. But Jesus doesn't open his eyes right now. He grabs him by the hand and takes him outside of the village. I, I know you're asking the question. That's why I love coming to preach for y'all, Grady Allen. Y'all such an astute congregation. Y'all know good Bible. I can already tell y'all been getting good preaching for a long time. So nothing wows you. you. You're not really taking off. But I will tell you there's a reason why Jesus decides to do this first. It's because oftentimes you and I, if we're not careful, will not, we'll miss the intent of Jesus beyond his miracles because his miracles also share with us his mission and his message. Because one of the things that we don't focus on enough in Scripture is not just the blessings of Jesus, but there are portions where Jesus has to do some cursing sometimes. You don't believe me? Move over to Matthew chapter 11. The text tells us that in Matthew 11, he curses a fig tree because of its unfruitfulness. But also in Matthew 11, he gives a list, if you will, of towns and cities that he curses. Why? Because they are faithless. He says, because of your faithlessness, I refuse to do any miracles there. Because you don't believe, because you don't trust, because you don't understand how I'm operating, I, I refuse uh, to do any supernatural things within the boundaries uh, of that area. And if you look at that list in Matthew 11, uh, right near the top of the list of places he curses uh, is a town called uh, Bethsaida. Now go back to Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 8, they bring the blind man to Jesus in a 
village called Bethsaida. So when they prayed to Jesus, we need you to open his eyes. Jesus can't go back on his word. So he says, you know what? I'm going to deal with your blindness, but first let me get you out of your Bethsaida because I cannot deliver you while you're still stuck in a space that does not believe that I am who I say I am. So I've got to get you out of your Bethsaida so that I can deal with your blindness. I come to wake somebody up today because you're angry that God ain't doing it now. You're angry that God ain't shifted the situation. Can I tell you, child of God, that oftentimes God can't deal with it until he deals with you. And sometimes he got to get you out of your Bethsaida because your Bethsaida is what's contributing to your blindness. So he got to move you out of your Bethsaida so that he can give you the healing that you need. I tell you, look at somebody and tell them, now it makes sense why that Bethsaida job keeps holding you back. That Bethsaida relationship keeps holding you back. That Bethsaida connection keeps holding you back. Jesus said, I got to get you out of your predicament, which means I've got to change your environment. Look at somebody beside you and say, that's all that God's trying to do. As long as you stuck in Bethsaida, you're going to always be blind. As long as you stuck in Bethsaida, you always going to be hurt. As long as you're stuck in Bethsaida, things will not come together. He got to get you out of Bethsaida first. I, I saw something recently that caught my attention. As I was reading and Miranda in the news because since COVID, I've become what you would call a social media doctor. <laughs> every new virus, every new thing out there, I'm, I'm scanning because I, I don't want to experience what we experienced a few years ago. So every time there's some medical catastrophe going on, I'm always watching. And y'all, I saw something that caused me to really get upset. That they found someone who had perished because they had caught a virus called the Alaska pox. Y'all, I was tripping. <laughs> I called my doctor real quick. I said, hey doc, um, can I get Alaska pox? My doctor started laughing. He said, Pastor, what you talking about? I said, man, I just read that somebody just died from Alaska pox. He said, Pastor, I never heard of that. I said, man, I'm reading an article. But as I kept reading the article, y'all, I found out something in the article that kind of helped me out a little bit, that I learned that there's such a thing called geographically distinct viruses. So when I read that, I asked my doctor, he said, oh, Pastor, what that simply means is you are safe as long as you're not there. If you're there, then you got to be careful because this virus only affects those in a, I wish I had time. So y'all, I live in Augusta. I start feeling good because until I see Augusta pox, I feel all right. But some of y'all looking at me funny because you're saying, well, Pastor, why should I be concerned about a geographically distinct virus? Well, uh, you may not need to be concerned about a geographically distinct virus, but maybe you need to be concerned about a geographically distinct issue uh, that until God moves you, uh, until you're willing to get out of your Bethsaida, because there's some viruses that you stuck with uh, as long as you stay uh, in that area leading over and tell somebody your environments must be changed. Its environments must be changed, text tells us. But then there's another layer to this process today that not only environments must be changed, but also number two, jot this down, evaluations must be candid. He takes the man outside of the village. Now, I know you shouted over the separation from Bethsaida, but also note this meant he had to separate from the very people that brought him to Jesus in the first place. Because not every separation is bad. Some separations are against good. But sometimes in order to get God, you got to leave good. Jesus takes him by the hand and he drabs the man outside of the village. This is interesting because by the time the miracle continues, what we see is Jesus and the man by themselves. If you are followers of Jesus, if you know how he operates in Scripture, this is a rarity. Matter of fact, there's only one of three miracles in the Scriptures that Jesus does on a private basis. It's just Jesus and the blind man. The man who's blind is now with Jesus. And the text says something interesting, that in that moment, the man standing in front of Jesus, the man who's blind, the text says, and then Jesus spits on the man's eyes. Okay, let me try it again. Oh. 
It's just Jesus and the man. The man blind, but he can hear. And the text says, and Jesus spits. Yo, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know which part of New York I was in, but this obviously got to be the bad and bougie part. I apologize. I, 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 I was under the illusion. I'm sorry. I, I won't make that mistake again at the next service. But I, I was under the illusion that to hear anybody say somebody spit on somebody, it's going to be some consequences and some repercussions. What? I mean, I know I can already hear it because some of y'all, if you're ready, you ain't going to say it out loud because you're trying to hide the hood in you in this very palatial uh, sanctuary. But there's a part of you that said, I wish he would have spit on me. I wish I, wish I had some real people. Uh, uh, and, and so I know there's some of you say, I don't care who he is, Jesus, uh, son of whoever, it don't matter. You ain't spitting on me. But, but I understand. That's why when you're reading scripture. You, you got to make sure that you read it in the context for which it was given. In those days, spitting was not seen as a sign of disrespect. Matter of fact, many during this time of antiquity considered spitting an essential part of the miraculous process. Why? Because they reviewed, they perceived spitting or spittle to be the essence of the individual. So don't think of Jesus toughen up spit what you should envision is a Jesus who places his hands in his mouth and then takes the spittle the essence of who he is and places it in the area that the man needs healed he places the spittle he places himself in the place where the man is blind in other words my brothers and sisters what happens in the miracle is Jesus takes a part of Jesus and puts it in the area that the man was dysfunctional at because he wanted wanted the man to know this ain't nobody else but me that's doing something on your behalf and every now and again I'm grateful that you can stand and hear somebody when they open their mouth they're just sending a piece of Jesus to you when when they open their mouth they're just sending you what you need and so Jesus puts himself in the place of dysfunction he places his spittle on the man's eyes and then love this steps back place spit on the man's eye then he asked him, and he said, all right, tell me, what do you see? He put, put, put spit on the man's eyes. He said, tell me what you see. And that's when the passage takes on a portion that you and I don't like, because most of us want relationship without responsibility. You, you want miracles, but you don't want to interact in the miraculous process. Jesus steps back and asks the man a question. I need you to be truthful with me. Tell me, what do you see? Give me your evaluation. And the Bible says, and the man looks intently. He forces himself to see. Because sometimes, if you have been in a situation for a period of time, there's a part of us that oftentimes gives up on it ever coming again. So this man had to understand through the evaluation from Jesus that if I'm going to get something, I got to do my part. I, I got to make sure that I add my little bit to this here. The problem is, is that we keep wanting the Lord to do everything, not understanding that God said, I'm going to give you the ability to work some stuff out on your own. You can pray for the job and fill out an application. You can pray for the relationship and go to counseling. You can pray to get healthy and go to the gym and learn how to eat right. Sometimes you got to participate in the process that God is doing. Tell me what you see. And I love this. Because Mama Flake, watch what he does. He looks. And then he says, well, I can see, but it ain't all the way correct. I see people, but they look like trees walking around. Boy, I feel like having some church there. His evaluation gives us some insight. Number one, it tells us, number one, the man ain't always been blind. Because if he was always blind, how would you know what people 
and trees look like. See, see, some of y'all don't understand. So what this man was in need of was not something new. He was in need of something that he had lost, which means there are some miracles the Lord will just restore back to you. I wish I had some people, maybe there's some folk in the balcony, and that's your testimony. That's what I'm trying to get, because I ain't always been this way. I ain't always been dysfunctional. I ain't always been like this, but thanks be to God, he gives us the process to give back what we had lost. He, he's now, he said, now, now I can see. But then he acknowledges, watch this. And this is where the mature folk got to catch in the miracle. But he said, I got to be honest with you. I'm better than I was, but it ain't clear. And I hear what some of you saying. Because if some of us would have been in the man shoes, we would have just been happy with better. We would have just said, well, at least I can see something. I mean, I mean, something is better than nothing. And better is being better than blind. And I know my brothers and sisters in the kingdom, we always shout over better. Oh, the Lord has made things better. Lord has made things better. But what if I told you that better ain't always the best? And sometimes you got to get it in your soul that I'm grateful for what you've done, Jesus. But I just got a sneaky suspicion that there's another level I can go to there. There's a something else I can get out of here. Now, this ain't for everybody in the house uh, because there's some of you that's just happy with better uh, and if you happy with better stay seated uh, but I want to talk to some folk in the house uh, that said I ain't just come to be better uh, I ain't just want a better life uh, I don't want to just a better family uh, I don't want just a better job uh, but I come because I got a sneaky suspicion uh, that God got something better on the side of better uh, that I'm not just going to handle where I am touch somebody beside you uh, and said I want God's best uh, and this is the year uh, that I Seats trying to just settle for better. I hear you. I get it. 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 He literally was saying, I can't settle for cloudy when clarity is available. I get you. I hear you. I'm your preacher. I'm your boy. I'm your main man. I'm I'm your writer. I can see. Because not a hundred people, not not a, not university center. So I know there's some of you on the sound of my voice that's saying, Well, Pastor, you don't understand. I'm just happy to be better. I'm just happy because you don't know what I had to endure and you don't know how well I'm doing with better. Well, let me just tell you what settling for better can limit you in. The year was 2019. There was a man by the name of Jameis Winston who was a quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that year. He ultimately got traded. The reason he got traded that year is because in 2019, Jameis Winston set an NFL record. NFL record, y'all, for interceptions in a season. In 2019, Jameis Winston threw 30 interceptions. Let me try that one more again. 30 interceptions. Anybody knows anything about football, know that the quarterback's job is to keep possession of the ball. Interceptions are considered turnovers, which can cost you time, points, and possessions. You don't want somebody who's turning the ball over. Do you know in 2019, they only played 16 regular season games? That means he literally was throwing almost two interceptions per game. They had to get the brother up out of there. But when they traded him, something happened. He posted on his social media that he then had LASIK surgery. And it was told that Jameis Winston had bad vision. Now, if you know anything about football, this makes no sense because Jameis Winston in high school was a high school All-American. He was the best football player in Alabama history with fuzzy vision. He gets recruited to Florida State, starts as a freshman, wins a national championship and a Heisman with fuzzy vision. He gets drafted number one in the NFL draft with fuzzy vision. But when he gets to the highest level, what he was able to succeed at with fuzzy vision in high school and uh, in college when uh, he gets to the pros uh, the very thing that he was able to manage well uh, in those lower levels uh, but when he got to the highest level because his vision wasn't clear uh, he ended up being disposable uh, and an afterthought I'm here to tell somebody in here because uh, I know you're trying to convince me uh, that you are better uh, but I want you to know that better is not God's best uh, and God said I need you at your best because uh, there's certain levels I can't take you to uh, until you have full clarity uh, which means as long as it's fuzzy uh, you can't exceed like you need to exceed environments 
must be changed. He says evaluations must be canned. And I'm final. Here's the third principle. Excuses must be canceled. <laughs> tell, tell Jesus, I can see, but ain't the best. It ain't clear. And the Bible says, and then Jesus touched the man again. Okay, hold on. Let me try it again. Uh, he took the blind man out of Bethsaida. Spit on his eyes. Step back. Tell me what you evaluate. Give me your honest opinion. The man says, I can see, but it ain't the best. I see people, but they look like trees. And because of his honest evaluation, Jesus, in our text, touches him again. Now, this has caused much contention for a lot of theologians because this seems to go against the grain of the main theological thrust of Mark. Mark, if you know anything about how he portrays Jesus, Jesus is the Jesus that does things suddenly and immediately. He's a Jesus that you don't have to wait long for him to turn things around. So this is an odd occurrence that in this miracle, in Mark chapter 8, Jesus didn't just touch the man once, he touched the man twice. So there's some who want to use this pericope to say that that means Jesus didn't have all power. That must mean that Jesus was kind of stunted or limited in his supernatural grace. But I want to offer another translation. I want to offer another idea because I want to suggest that the reason Jesus touched a man a second time is because the second time was a response to the man's faith. If you remember the first time Jesus touched him, it wasn't because the man believed, it's because he had some friends who believed. And so the first touch Jesus did was based on their request. The first touch was because they needed uh, Jesus to do it. But the second chance uh, and the second touch was not because uh, there was somebody else interceding for the man. Uh, the second time uh, is because the man realized uh, I need it for myself. I ought to talk to somebody in here uh, and that's your position uh, is because because you need the Lord to touch you again but this time you say touch me Lord cause not my mama not my daddy but it's me oh Lord standing in the need of prayer maybe I'm the only lonesome person in the building that can testify that's why I need the Lord to touch me again I need the Lord to touch me cause this time I know what he can do this time I know he can do it this time I know he can heal last time it's my mama and last time it was my friend the last time it was my pastor, but this time I'm needing the Lord to touch me again. Just shake someone hand real quick and say, neighbor, I just need him to touch me again. Because the Bible says that when he touched him again, his eyes got opened up and he could see clearly. Now, I told you I go through the airport and the airport will go on the intercom and say sometimes that if you see something, you ought to say something. Which means if the Lord has done anything for you, you ought to open your mouth and declare it was nobody but Jesus. If the Lord has done anything for you, then you got to make the declaration that I can see and I can see because it's Jesus that helped me see. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done, Mama Fleck. I'm done. His eyes are open. He's no longer blind. But y'all, can I be honest with y'all? The Bible will sometimes jack up a good sermon because I wish I could tell you that's the end of the miracle. I wish I could tell you that that's the conclusion of what takes place, but that's not how the miracle ends. Because the miracle does not end with the man having his eyes opened by Jesus, no. The miracle ends with Jesus telling the man what he can't do. He says, all right, now I've opened up your eyes. However, there you cannot go back to the village. In other words, Jesus is telling the man, listen, I've done my part. I've made sure that you can see clearly. However, now you're going to have to learn how to manage the miracle yourself. And if the vision means anything to you, then there's some places, there's some people that you can't go back to. Uh oh, I done got in trouble and y'all ain't ready to help me close it. But that's my final saying to somebody in here. Please, ma'am, please, sir, don't allow the Lord to give you the miracle and you mismanage it. Don't allow the Lord to open up your eyes and you go back blind because you can't afford because you keep wanting to go back to those wrong villages. Can I tell you that the Bible tells us that wrong villages can jack up right vision which means every now and again I got to use some of my discernment and I got to say Lord help me that I don't jack up what you did. Help me Lord that I don't do undo what you have done. Lean over to somebody and say neighbor there's some villages you can't go back to. There's some people you can't call no more. There's some jobs you can't go into. 
there's some areas you can't go near that if the Lord has done anything for you you ought to make sure that you honor God by managing it well do me a favor and just wave at somebody and tell them don't go back say neighbor he's done too much he said too much he's blessed too much that you can't go back no more I got to get out of here may the Lord bless you real good but I know you're still wondering did I make my connection well as I sat on that plane and I was still thinking it's getting mighty close I'm glad to report that as I sat in my seat that same pilot came back on the intercom and this is what he said he said I got good news ladies and gentlemen the fog has lifted so now I need you to buckle your seatbelts cause it's time to take off and that's all I came to tell somebody at the 9 o'clock service is that when you meet Jesus he'll lift the fog from you when you meet Jesus he'll get you ready on the straightaway and if you believe today that the Lord has done it I dare you to be like me on the plane and buckle your seatbelt and get ready to take off I gotta get out of here but I need some folk that believe I'm going higher to bump your neighbor real quick and say excuse me neighbor but I got somewhere to be I got some destiny to accomplish I got some promise that I gotta get and the only way I can get it is I gotta fasten my seatbelt and get ready to take off are you ready to take off oh shucks y'all ain't ready are you ready to take off oh shucks y'all ain't ready maybe somebody in the balcony are you ready to take off well if you're ready to take off stand to your feet buckle your seatbelt and we're getting ready to take off today are you ready to take off give your neighbor some room and say excuse me neighbor but I got somewhere to be buckle your seatbelt real quick tell your neighbor buckle up buckle up we got somewhere that we need to be so in three we gonna take off are you ready are you ready on three we gonna take off are you ready if you're ready say I'm ready one I'm buckled good two got my peanuts on my side three take off take off take off I need to hear somebody tell them I'm taking off I got places I got people take off he's gonna take you where you need to be shout it shout it shout it Everyone standing, everyone standing. Touch that person beside you, tell them, neighbor, I ain't gonna be here long. Tell them I'm about getting ready to take off. Cause the fog has lifted. Play softly for me as we stand. Dr. Flake has given me instruction to extend the invitation. You don't have to stay the same way because no one who meets Jesus ever stays the same however there is a process to this and sometimes the greatest challenge we have is that many of us don't want change bad enough because it's easier to stay dysfunctional. Because staying dysfunctional keeps us in a comfortable place where we expect nothing and want nothing beyond it. Yeah. Because I've learned something in close to 20 years of pastoring is that many people 
like being the victim. They enjoy having something to always complain about. Well, you know I can't see, so you know. <laughs> because the miracle requires management. See, when you're blind, you have to rely on others. Sight means there's some things I have to do on my own. There's emancipation and liberation that occurs when you can see. I won't send that today because I'm not one of those preachers that tells you everything is going to be all right and every day going to be sunny. No, there's going to be some rain. Matter of fact, anyone who rides planes know turbulence happens. They picked me up yesterday as I came in from my hometown of Greensboro. And as most people do when they ask, how was your flight? I have a thing that I say every time, it landed. <laughs> Any flight that lands is a good flight. <laughs> Which means, even though there was some turbulence, I still landed. Even though there was some redirects, I still landed. And someone needs to hear that today. I want to extend the invitation if you're here to first of all, meet Christ, join the church, secondly, because that's important. Christ offers you and I a change, a difference. When I think about what Christ has done in my life, Lord knows when I make that decision at eight years old and I walk down that aisle at Morton Temple United Holy Church and gave my life to Christ, there were some bumps along the way. It wasn't because Jesus had shifted, just because life be life in. But here's the amazing thing, when life be life and God be God, and I'm here to tell you, he'll do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. So if you're here today and you do not know Christ, I want you to make that decision today. I want you to walk down and publicly declare. Maybe there's someone online who wants to make that decision. It's on you as well. But there's no greater decision you can make. And if you don't get anything else, I'm not making these to do promises. The one promise that I can tell you is that coming to Christ offers something for all of us need, which is forgiveness. Yeah. It's a part of our relationship with Christ that we don't oftentimes hit up, but... Jesus forgives. No matter what you've done, he forgives. No matter what you've experienced, he forgives. No matter how tough life, he forgives. And if you hear under the sound of my voice today and you need that forgiveness, come. I want, to, I want you to meet us at this altar. I don't care what you've done, where you've been. I don't care what you're still doing. He can still forgive. They said he, he saves one of my favorite songs of all time, he saves to the uttermost from the guttermost. He saves. And if you're here today, come, make that decision. If you're here and you need to make that, this church, this panel, I see you coming. God bless you. There's some who are making their way. There's others who are making their decision. God bless you. We're going to meet you. Are there others, even if you're on the balcony, we wait on you. Or maybe there's others who want to make that call. And so I want you to step out by faith today. It's a, it's a faith walk. It's not, a, it's not an easy walk, but it's a faith walk. And we want to celebrate with you. And if you're here today and you say, well, listen, I'm saved, Pastor, but I do need a church home. And I can't think of a greater place to be than Greater Allen Cathedral. You become greater at greater. I like that. If you're here, I want you to come. If you're here and you need to make the decision for the church, come. If you're here and you say, listen, I really need to get myself together. Listen, don't hold off tomorrow what you can do today. All of us are works in progress. Listen, all of us are. We need some help. I don't know about you. I need help. Every day I wake up, Lord, I need some help today. Help me when I get on this job and help me with these families and help me with these things. If you're here and you need that relationship, I want to extend it to you. As they sing, we're going to give one more invitation. If you need Christ, come. If you need a church, come. Come, come on.
Thank you for the word we've received today. And God, I pray that we become good managers of the miracle. Lord, I thank you that we once were blind, but you can give us sight. We glorify you in this wonderful, matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, amen. I want you to rush this moment. If you're here in the room and you want further prayer, you want to connect with someone in prayer, we invite you to follow our leaders out of the door to my left and to your right, our discipleship ministry. Even if they're still walking the aisle, you can grab one of them and ask them for prayer. They will lead you to the chapel for further ministry and prayer today. Hallelujah. How many of you were blessed by the word this morning? How many of you believe that you're getting clearer for takeoff? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's take one more time and celebrate God for his manservant, Reverend Dr. Charles Goodman. Come on, let's celebrate God for him, for the gift of God that he is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to Jesus. As we get ready to go down from this place, take a moment. If you're comfortable, you can join hands with your neighbor as we sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise him Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory majesty dominion and power now and forevermore let all of God's people shout hallelujah come on shout hallelujah and amen to attend our weekly Bible studies, young adults on Mondays, church-wide on Wednesdays, men on Thursdays, and couples on Saturdays. All Bible studies are virtual and begin at 7 p.m. Visit the website for login and streaming details. Women's Season Virtual Bible Study with Rev. Lane continues tomorrow night at 7 o'clock p.m. The book of study is Overcoming Fear, Worry, and Anxiety, authored by Elise Fitzpatrick. Stream on the church website. The Lawyers Guild is hosting a family court webinar, a discussion on navigating issues of child support on Thursday, March 22nd, starting at 6.30 p.m. Visit the website to register. The Women's Ministry is hosting Sister to Sister. All women are encouraged to invite a sister or good girlfriend and join us on Saturday, March 23rd at 12 o'clock p.m. in the Cathedral Banquet Hall. Visit the website for more details. Holy Week will begin with our Palm Sunday service March 24th and continue Monday, March 25th with our Four Women at the Cross service at 7.30 p.m. with preachers Rev. Dr. Sharika Newton, Pastor T.M. Brown-Williams, Pastor Melanie Rochford, and our very own Rev. Marissa Farrow. Then join us for our Monday Thursday service March 28th with guest preacher Pastor Jerry Carter and Good Friday on March 29th at 12 o'clock p.m. featuring a few of GAC's ministerial staff. Holy Week will culminate on Resurrection Sunday, March 31st, and the conclusion of our Lenten fast. 
The Sunday School presents its annual Resurrection Sunday program, Easter Sunday, March 31st, during the 11.30 a.m. service in the lower level of the cathedral. Following the program, the Sunday School will host a bake sale. All proceeds go towards the Sunday School College Scholarship Fund for graduating seniors. The North Carolina Club is hosting a defensive driving course on Saturday, March 30th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Allen Senior Citizen Complex Building A. This is a certified course enabling you to deduct up to 10% off of your insurance premium and points off your driver's license. You can contact one of the listed members of the North Carolina Club for details and registration. Save the date for Women's Conference, April 11th through the 13th at the Stamford Marriott in Stamford, Connecticut. Registration is still open. You can register online at www.gacwomen.org. For more information regarding our virtual, hybrid, and on-site events, please visit our website at www.allencathedral.org. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We invite you to stay connected with us on our website at allencathedral.org and across our social platforms, including our YouTube channel, Facebook page, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. Give tithes and offerings on our website and mobile app, which can be downloaded from the iTunes store and Google Play. Visit our website and listen to our daily prayers, watch Bible studies, see featured videos, and more on our mobile app and the church website. Subscribe to receive our weekly digital event calendar and text alerts by going to the church website at allencathedral.org and follow the prompts to subscribe. You are invited to join us on our live prayer line weeknights at 8 p.m. to 8.20 p.m. and Saturdays at 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. where you will hear from Pastor Elaine Flake and friends. The dial-in details are available on our website. Again, we are so grateful for the opportunity to worship with you today. Our church doors are open. We would love to worship with you in person Sundays at 9 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. There is a seat for you, so join us. We continue to keep your safety and health in mind. So stay connected throughout the week, and we look forward to worshiping with you again next week. To God be the glory. <laughs>